All right, so welcome back. So this lecture is going to go over the bryophytes and some of the seedless plants. So one thing you're going to have to do is call the plant scavenger hunt. And I'm going to ask you to find some different examples from different categories. And then you're going to have to go through and just use the scientific name. Um, I'll talk about it in one of the weekly updates, but there's also detail on the assignment. Uh, have fun with this. Don't stress too much. It's actually going to be a lot easier. And uh, don't worry too much. Like I said, if you're having trouble finding one, um, moss is probably going to be the hardest one to find, but we'll figure it out. So you saw this slide before, but we're going to start talking about the bryophytes first. We're just going to hit on them a little bit, and then we're going to hit a little bit on the seedless plants right here. So first off with non-vascular plants, the key thing about them is they lack vessels for conducting water and foodstuffs throughout the plant. Now with these plants, you're going to see them very, be very simple. They're going to be located in areas that are going to be very moist because think about they don't have the vascular tissue so it's not easy for them to move um, water and nutrients throughout the whole plant. Now you're going to see these in certain areas. Um, they're going to be the major flora for areas like the tundra and we'll talk about what the tundra is when we talk about biomes but these are very cold areas. Um, then like moss is a key thing here and it find, provides a key fee source, food source for animals that thrive in this area. Um, there's about 25,000 species, and you're going to see with these most dominant stage is going to be the gametophyte. Now, these are the very earliest of the terrestrial plants, and it will be broken down into three phylum. So we'll go over these briefly. So the first one is phylum Marchinianophyta. Like I said, I'm going to mess up a lot of these names for the rest of the semester. I'm so sorry. Now, this is probably the closest related ancestor to the vascular plants adapted to the terrestrial environment. So he of the bryophytes, this is probably um, the most advanced, if you want to think about it that way. Um, they've colonized every terrestrial habitat on Earth. I find that quite fascinating because if you think about certain habitats are actually really harsh and these guys have figured out how to survive in all of them. Um, there are about 7,000 species and the reason to get the name liverwort, if you look at it, they have this flat thallus which is part of their um, gametophyte and it kind of looks like, like the different lobes of the liver. Now, phylum Anthocerotophyta, hopefully I got all that, are your hornworts. Now, these do have the flat lobe like right there, but you're going to start to see those little stems right there. Um, they have colonized various habitats, but one thing about these guys, especially all these um, non-vascular ones, they're always going to be close to a water source. But they're going to have this sporophyte right here that's going to be that long, narrow pipe light. And there's about 100 different species. As I mentioned, your book doesn't go into extreme detail about these. Um, I'm just kind of hitting on the key points. And then the phylum bryophyta, the mosses, which is probably going to be the one that you're going to have to find. You're just going to find one example um, in, when it comes to the um, plant scavenger hunt, and I will try to find some um, good locations to find them too and let y'all know about them. Now, this is the most numerous of all the non-vascular plants, about 10,000 species. Now, they are going to be anchored by a root-like um, rhizoid structure. With that, you have that right there, but they're going to have several cells that are going to be absorbing water. So you're going to see them most likely in these moist environments. Now they have these things that almost resemble true leaves. They're like these green, flattened, like blade-like, leaf-like structures right here. Um, they're only one cell strip, um, thick, sorry, and they lack vascular strands and stomata. Now, most of the time, they're going to use capillary action when it comes to um, absorbing water and moving it around. But what's interesting about these guys is they can go for long periods of drying out. And then once the water source is available, they can revive themselves. And these are mostly going to be found in the really cold region, the Arctic and the tundra. And as I mentioned before, they are a key indicator of pollution. So one thing that we want to go through and measure, do we have high pollution in the atmosphere? Let's look at the mosses. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the life cycle, but this is a little video that goes through the whole life cycle of the moss, and you'll understand what is this little structure right here that I'm looking at compared to the leaf-like structures you see below. 
Now the book does talk a little bit more about the vascular plants. So remember, we're going to break vascular plants into the seedless and the seeded ones. Now basically the seed is just a resistant structure used to protect the embryo from drought. Um, we'll get into that in the next two lectures, but we're going to focus on the seedless ones. Now we're going to break it up into some smaller subgroups right here. Um, you're going to see them the lycophytes and pterophytes, and um, the, each of those groups you'll see smaller subgroups right there. Now, the seedless vascular plants like firms, um, they were very, very um, proliferative, especially during the carnivorous period. Um, these are some of the earliest land plants, and they really were most common at that area. Um, when things go through change and all that stuff, our, a lot of our modern day coal is thanks to old ferns and all that stuff. So when there's a mass extinction event, and weather changes, what happened is all these ferns died and they form what are called these peat, deposit, peat deposits that eventually have formed coal. So all coal that's being burned now are old um, fossilized ferns. So here's a few of the phylum, um, the key ones. So uh, phylum lycopidifida, lyco or the club mosses, are going to be the earliest group of the seedless vascular plants. They're going to kind of resemble the mosses um, in a lot of the physiology and the morphology. Now they are really dominated the landscapes early on and they have a stem and they have what we call microfills. Um, there are about 12,200 species and they are broken up into these different ones, the club worts, club mosses, and the spike mosses. Like I mentioned, the book doesn't go into too much about these guys. Now phyla monolophyta are the horse tails. Um, you're going to find these mostly in damp environments and the marshes, and you're going to see these joints or nodes. That's how this phylum is characterized. So each of these little nodes and joints are here. Now, most of photosynthesis, they really don't have leaves. It's going to happen here in the stems in this phylum right here. All right, phylum, phylum monophyta are, which are your worst forms. Um, they're going to lack roots and leaves, which I find that quite interesting. So you're going to see these green stems that have these like little nodes on it. And they're going to keep branching and all other stuff. And this is where photosynthesis is going to take place. So there's no real leaves on that. It's kind of wispy. That's the name whisper. But the one that you'll probably be more um, related to is phylomonophyta, the true ferns. And this is the class poly polyposophyta. Like I said, I can, I'm butchering these like they're crazy. Um, these are going to be your most advanced seedless vascular plants. And when you have to find some examples, ferns are great examples to use for your plant scavenger hunt. There's about 20,000 species, and they have various habitats, um, especially you'll find them from the tropics to the temperate forest. Um, they do love to be in shady spaces, and um, the diversity of this group really did expand in the Carboniferous period. So about the fern life cycle, I know this looks kind of scary, but there's a video on the next slide that will kind of help you. So if you have a fern, remember we talked about the sporophyte and the gametophyte. So remember, sporophyte is when you have diploid, gametophyte you only have one. All right, so we're going to go through the process. If you look under the leaf of the fern, boom, 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 underneath back right there, you see those little sporangium. They're like little do 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 do. Now, these are going to be haploid cells, boom, 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 right there, if you look at them under the microscope, and those are your spores. Now, what's going to happen, each of these spores are going to grow into a photosynthetic prothallus gametophyte, and it's going to remain haploid. So each spore is going to go, and it's going to grow into this little gametophyte phase right here, this prothallium. Now, each prothallus, prothallus is going to produce its own gametes. It's going to produce sperm and eggs on the same plant, plantlet. Plant is the right word right there. And it's in two different areas. Now, it's going to happen in two different areas. Um, the sperm are going to form in the anthridium, and the females are going to form the archegonium. And it's going to use water in order to go through and move to the male, the sperm to the female egg and go through the process of fertilization. So when water is present, the sperm use their flagellum to swim to there, and then we're going to have fertilization, so we're going to go from the haploid to the diploid state to the sporophyte. Now the fertilized egg, egg is going to stay remain attached to the prothallus, 
So this little plant like right here. And the egg is going to be a diploid zygote. And that's going to go through and form the sperm. Sorry, the actual sperm sporophyte that you're used to seeing. I know that seems really confusing. And I know this video, it's super cheesy. It's a cartoon, but it gets the point across. And it's well worth the watch. I probably do a better job of explaining it. Like I said, I only get to teach this once a year. Um, and plant reproduction is not my strong suit. Like I said, I'm a big human reproduction person. So watch this. I know it's stupid, but it's actually kind of funny. Now, why should you care? You know, a little terrarium that's quite cute. So mosses and liverworts are often the first um, macroscopic organisms to colonize areas. Um, we'll talk about pioneer species when it comes to ecology. But a lot of these um, plants in these groups provide food and shelter for other plant species. And they're the ones that are going to thrive in the hostile environments first. And we that's really important because we have to have the first pioneer species there to kind of start to establish it, start to break down the soil into smaller nutrients so other things can come through and establish it. And they do form the base of a lot of food chains. Um, I mentioned that they are indicators for pollution problems, which is something we're constantly battling. And they are very key essential for prevention of erosion because they're going to be located primarily closer to the, the ground. We use them for all kinds of different things, for tools, fuel, and medicine, and, you know, ornamental is also a source of coal, as I mentioned earlier. So lots of diversity and essential uses for these simple little plants that we just talked about. So no review videos with this one, but here are my credits to my images.